Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this learning experience brought to you by Stack Identity. My name is Cody, and welcome back to Tech Strong Learning. We've got an exciting panel ahead, but before we get that ball rolling, we do have just a couple of housekeeping notes I'd like to review. First of all, today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion, if you'd like to rewatch at a later time, or if you'd like to share our insights with your team, of course, you will be receiving an email with a link to access the recording on demand shortly after we conclude this live session today. So if you'd like to engage with us, there are a couple of ways to do so. The first and the easiest option is the chat tab on the right side of your screen. So if you see that chat tab, let us know from where in the world you are joining us. If you have any specific questions, please send those into our Q&A tab. Sending the questions to that Q&A just helps us keep track of all of the questions that come in and we want to answer as many as we can. Um, and the, that Q&A tab can be found on the right side of the chat section. Additionally, we will have two polls that will pop up on your screen throughout our program today. So please keep an eye out for those. And of course, there are a couple of handouts there in the handout section. So feel free to grab those additional links. They are, I believe, on slide nine of our conversation today. So we put them in the handout section for easy access. And finally, before we close things out today, we are giving away two $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around to see if you're one of our lucky winners. So our topic is shadow access, where identity access management meets cloud security. And I'm joined today by Vinkit Raghavan, founder and CEO of Stack Identity, Ken Foster, VP of IT Governance, Risk, and Compliance for Fleet Corps, and Al Gauss, CISO, advisor, and investor at SnapDocs. So Vincat, Ken, and Al, thank you so much for joining us today. Vincat, how would you like to go ahead and get this conversation started? Thank you, Cody. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us from. We're thrilled to have you here, and thank you for joining. We have a super exciting webinar today. The topic is mm -hmm. Identity and Access Management Meets Cloud Security. Let me set the context as to why we should care about this problem and right now. The first is the business context. Data and abundance is driving the business economy. Developers and product teams are building innovative data applications that are the engine of business growth. We all know that. The second is the cloud context. The cloud is the undisputable platform for data and AI applications, and therefore cloud growth is accelerating massively across enterprises. The third is the IAM context that we're here to talk about today. When conventional IAM meets modern cloud security, we see massive stress points emerging. We know for a fact that identity credentials and entitlements are the root cause of most modern cloud data breaches, data exfiltration, and unauthorized access leading to security incidents and breaches. Since we're talking extensively about IAM and cloud, let's do a bit of a level setting for our audience. IAM is a process that implements the guardrails to make sure only the right users have the right access to the right systems and for the right reasons. Uh, identity access management or IAM was developed for the on-prem world and mostly focused on human identities driven by productivity and compliance needs. It was never designed as a security process. Cloud environments, on the other hand, are built on a foundation of identities and entitlements. AWS alone has 15,000 permissions, and anything that runs in the cloud needs an identity and an entitlement. Our research suggests that only 5% of identities in the cloud are human, and 95% are non-human identities. Therefore, there's a huge focus and impetus on securing identity and entitlements in cloud environments. Now, what's common between the worlds of IAM and cloud security are privileges and entitlements. While IAM processes deeply care about entitlements, they weren't designed for the speed, scale, or the architecture, or the usage of the cloud. And what we're seeing in cloud environments is lots of entitlements and privileges that are unauthorized, unmonitored, invisible, and unintended. And this creates massive blind spots for many IAM processes. We call the shadow access an emerging problem when IAM meets cloud security. The Cloud Security Alliance has done a tremendous amount of work in this area, and this is a fascinating new problem space for our practitioners. So let's dive into it with our panel. 
Al and Ken, thank you for being here as well. Let me start with a basic definition. What is shadow access in your view? Al, let me, let me can you, perhaps you can start the discussion then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's good to be here with you all. Um, you know, in my mind, shadow access um, is prevalent when you have, uh, and I emphasize this, intended or unintended um, toxic combination of whether it's human or non-human machine identities and uh, risky access patterns or mechanisms. <clears throat> um, and, you know, the, the idea here is that these are increasingly generated through automated fashion these days. So it, it propagates the problem, exasperates the situation. And so what happens at the end is the impact is to the sensitive data that we're all trying to protect in the cloud. And so when I say toxic combinations, I want to I want to clarify a little bit. It's the combination of identities and access types, right? So from identities, we're talking about you know third parties potentially, um, stale accounts, dormant accounts, uh, machine identities for that matter. And in terms of access mechanism or access vectors, we're talking about overprivilege, unauthorized access, cross account access, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So when you take these two things and you combine them together, whether it's intended or unintended, to me, that becomes shadow access. Thank you, Al. Can uh, start the same question for you? Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a, a ton I can add on, on what Al walked through, right? It, it, it Ultimately, in its very basic definition, is that access that's granted through um, typically what we would think of is it's, it's through nested permissions or nested roles and groups, right? It is that, that un, like you said, that unknown. And, and, and it, it may not initially look like it could be malicious or could be a problem for you, but down the road, because the, the person who you thought's only going to have access to this one area now all of a sudden has access to uh, sensitive data, maybe, maybe they have the ability to push a change or make a change and they think they're doing it to a non-production environment, they're doing it to a production environment. So this overprivileging that happens in the background that we're unaware of um, is, is one of the, is probably the biggest way I define shadow access, right? I, I think that's, I think that's the number one way I would define it. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Ken. I picked up a few terms here. Uh, toxic combinations from Al. I picked up the fact that there are different identity types, access types, and you put, put them together, they'll create shadow access. And can you kind of talk about nested groups and the ability to kind of provide unintended access? You're not even sure it's, it's for the right reasons. You can, you can see it. You can feel it. And that creates shadow access. A great point. So can I, you know, both of you have operational jobs. You manage large teams. So how is shadow impact impacting uh, your security operations? And then I'll go to your cloud operations second. Two part question, impact of shadow access on your security operations and your regular cloud operations. Uh, Ken, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think when I look at it purely from, um, when I'm looking at it from the security operations standpoint, right? Let's imagine you have had some kind of event or incident, right? Not gonna throw the, the B word out there just yet, but let's just say you've had an event or an incident, right? And you're trying to chase back how that happened. And you're trying to look back through what actually caused that problem, right? <clears throat> and because this access is not part of the normal workflow, normal day uh, access that someone would have, it, it's very hard to root out. And it's a very manual process today to be able to dig through all the log files, all of the information and go, oh, well, so-and-so had this access and they made this change. And when they made that change, it caused this problem or gave them, mm -hmm. they were able to move some data around or something like that, right? The problem is now, now you've got to take probably out of your security response, uh, an incident response or, and take it out of that team. Now you need to go to your, probably to your governance team, right? And go, well, how did this person get access? Now you probably are going to have to go through and do a bunch of manual, laborious, and tedious root cause finding to see how they actually got granted that access. And then eventually you're going to figure out is that, well, nobody actually granted them that access. They got assigned a role that somehow allowed that to happen. Or in what really happens a lot of times, they said, 
their identity should be the same as Vinket's identity, and it got copied, and it wound up giving them a lot of access because Vinket had shadow access that he didn't even realize he had because of moving within the company in different roles and different changes. Because that move ad, uh, those move ad uh, change roles, it's it's difficult to do, and it gets even more difficult when we move it over into our cloud environment, right? Because those those identities tend to not be directly connected into our um, on-prem tooling. Our on-prem tooling wasn't necessarily meant to track that they track that identity in there and that causes a lot of problems. So it really makes it hard to chase down when and why something has happened. And now if we're trying to detect on anomalies in the security operation side, well, if you got permission, you've got an account that has actual permission to this and it's doing something that looks like it's in part of your everyday job, even though you may not know you have the permission to do this, it doesn't raise any flags because you're doing something that your access actually has has the capabilities to do. So it's probably not going to trip any flags. It's probably not going to cause any uh, eyes to be raised right off initially. So now you've got, it takes longer to detect when something is awry and when maybe a malicious actor, actor has compromised those credentials, it becomes much more difficult to see that in real time and figure out. Normally now what we're talking about is instead of real time and maybe catching something in the act, we're now talking about all this investigation that has to happen after something happened. And that's way too late when we're talking about this, right? If it's after something has happened. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Al, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think Ken uh, <clears throat> covered all the most of the salient points here. I think you know, I go back to what's missing today, operationally from my perspective, is context. Uh, whether that's the user entity, the machine entity, and the business context for which what they need access for. So, if you look at, for example, your access tokens today, API keys, even users. You know, a lot of us don't have the context of within which they need access to certain assets in the in the enterprise. Um, so that makes it difficult for us to dynamically manage, you know, the right access, the right individual, I should say, right asset, right, uh, right data at the right time. Um, and so when you combine all that together, and what Ken said, it makes it really hard for us to follow up and decipher what what's an event and what's an incident. Um, you know, does uh, person X ha should have should they have access the level of access that they need to this particular asset, whether it's a database or an application, whatever the case. Uh, a lot of times we don't know that, and we just assume that it's the right access. Um, and so that makes it difficult for us to be able to monitor right observability is missing, and then when that's missing, then everything else falls apart, whether it's governance, compliance, or the ability to you know respond to a threat and be able to manage an incident effectively. Um, so it's a, it's a, unfortunately it's a, it's a chain, right? And kind of like dominoes, when, you, when the first domino falls, everything else falls after it. And I think that's the situation that we're faced with operationally in a lot of our organizations. Well, thanks, Al. If I can build on that a, a quick uh, short follow-up question. You know, you know, you talked about security and operations, right? But operations seems to want to go fast. Mm -hmm. And they most of the time don't care about security issues. They want to automate access and move on because everything is about deployment velocity and speed, right? And to Ken's point, uh, if you're finding it after the fact, it's a huge problem. How do you bring those things together? I mean, if you say that shadow access exists, and if you all agree that it, the first thing we need to uh, detect as soon as possible and fix it, where is the buy-in between the operations teams running workloads and going fast, and the security teams looking at managing the risk and you know the breach and incident world that you guys live in? How do you think about that? bringing those teams together in, in this problem. Ken, perhaps I'll start with you then. Yeah, so I think the interesting thing is, right, is you're right. These operational teams want to move fast. They want to be able to deploy at the speed of business, right? They want to be able to deliver. Um, I think the thing is, is if you're, if you're tightly integrated and you're building out a well-thought-out process and you understand how data, or sorry, not data, identity, if you understand how identity flows throughout your environment, how it's being used, how, how you need to architect and orchestrate the, the way identity uses and, and helps you deliver that, you can now actually automate that at a lower risk profile at the right permission level and actually build speed. 
because now we don't have to worry about something that's breaking if we need to change identity or change access, right? Because what we've done is we've mapped that out well. We understand how identity is flowing through our environment. And we can actually enable those teams to work together, understand how data needs, how the uh, identity needs to work within their application with the supporting underlying systems and interact. And if we build that out and we put a well thought program in place for that and the right governance checks in place with it with automation, it actually will enable them to go a lot faster because now they're not requesting access. Now they're not having to wait on somebody to come back and go, are you sure Al needs access to this database and why does he need? Because if you think about the traditional process of going through and establishing access and entitlements, a lot of times it can be onerous. It can be cumbersome. It can take days to provide access to something. So if we spend the time up front understanding this and building out that tight integration when, between the teams and automate a, a well thought out process, it will actually enable them to move much faster at a lower risk. Yeah, Vicar, if I may add, I see I see this as a double-edged sword. That this this um, automation and uh, moving fast. Um, I think without the proper, I, I believe in it. Don't get me wrong. I believe in automation. I believe in infrastructure as code and all that. What I've seen a lot of times missing in the whole process is that oversight. That I don't want to call it change control because that's more of like a legacy term. But the ability for security teams to monitor to determine if the particular change is going to have an adverse effect, whether that's an IAM role or or you know uh, resource change. Um, if you if there isn't proper oversight, what typically happens is we can exasperate shadow access by literally using automation and automation that we are you know telling our counterparts on engineering teams to implement so that we can improve security, but it could backfire if you don't have those proper safeguards in place. And I've seen this in real life where, you know, everybody followed process, they went through their, you know, infrastructure as code, their Terraform change, they made the change, they had a peer review, but guess what? Uh, there was an oversight from a security perspective, they made the wrong change, and next thing you know, you have unfeathered access to certain resources from the outside. So, um, so that's a, that's a, that's a real life, real, life problem I think we have if we don't have those guardrails in place. That's a great segue out to the next question, which is all about you know governance and compliance, right? So we built IAM systems with very good governance for the last 20 years or so. Now the cloud has come in and said, wait a minute, this is all automation. It's all infrastructure as code. It's Terraform. So the whole model of uh, governance has been inverted, right? You know, you you provision access first and then you kind of figure out you know what's wrong with that. So how do you start to think about your, your, your built up IAM process around governance and compliance? How do you react to this new world of speed and deployment? Uh, Ken talked about the whole flows. And it's, there's a new architecture that's emerging, right? Yeah. And, and how do you think about this governance as a, as a reimagination concept or even compliance? So uh, maybe perhaps, uh, Ken, you can start with that uh, thought and maybe give us your point of view. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the big thing for me is, is that the, the way we do governance today is <laughs> on identity specifically is a little, it's a little broken, right? Because it is typically it winds up being a very manual, very time consuming problem because we have multiple sources of truth. We have multiple, um, we have also multiple data sources that are not technically the source of truth. So you have multiple sources of truth, you have multiple applications, you have multiple data sets. Now you've got to correlate and get all this data clean into a way that you can now do a proper user access review. Number one, that's the number one problem. We have a data quality issue, right, yeah. typically. The second part of that is, is we have not traditionally followed easy to and we do and, and it's, we do it to ourselves in a lot of ways that just i'm thinking about this naming conventions on entitlements whether that's a role a group or even some permissions right we tend to make them nonsensical to and we try to make them nonsensical to an outside actor the problem is is we never really teach people what that stuff means when we're bringing in a new manager or a new supervisor or someone who's in charge of validating that I need the access that I need. 
So when they look at a, the all the entitlements I've been signed and go, does Ken need entitlement two four three X Y Z D you know dash ATL? Does he need that? Well, the best part they can probably figure out of that is he's probably in Atlanta, <laughs> or, or at least the, the 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 thing he needs to access is in Atlanta, right? And they go, well, he lives in Atlanta. Give him access to it. The problem and what you wind up with is over time, people change, people move, right? And what you wind up with is a, a manager who's presented. And if he has, he or she has a few hundred people underneath them, that that access list may become 15, 1600 entitlements that they need to look at. Yeah. And they're going to look at this massive list, whether it's in a spreadsheet, whether it's an email, whether it's in any of the governance tools out there for identity governance today, it's going to give you a web page portal with a list of stuff. And you're going to have to go, well, I either have to spend a lot of time out of my day, go research all this until it becomes second nature to me that I know what all this stuff means, or I'm going to go, Al still works for me. Yep, he gets access, right? And it's it's a checkbox thing, right? So that's what I think is wrong with identity governance today is that we, we have so much uh, uncorrelated, incorrect data that has poor quality. We can't make the right decision. We're making a decision because somebody told us we had to make it decision. But the truth is, if out of the, the 500 things that are on my list to do for the day, reviewing somebody's identity, <laughs> although it's important mm -hmm. and it's incorrect, and it is, especially as we talk about the move and the shift into the cloud world where identity becomes a core security control, like you said early on, never was designed, but it's a core security control inside the cloud. And now I just want to get that off my plate so I can go deal with the other things that I need to deal with. And as long as you're still employed, you're probably going to get more access than you need because we're not, a, we don't have the capability to spend the time and the effort, or we don't have a clear understanding of what we're actually approving access to. And, and that I think is the number one problem with governance. Mm -hmm. I do think it needs to be automated. I do think it needs to be better thought out. I need to, I do <laughs> think we need to figure out ways to make sure people understand what they're approving. We need to have more, more ways of saying, Hey, this, this, you, you realize you're giving person maybe just a, a flag that says, Hey, you're giving somebody access to an area that's deemed as critical and sensitive to the company. And do you know, do you actually want to do it? And I hate to say it, go back to that simple thing, just a checkbox that goes, do you, your know, pop-up says, do you, are you sure? And maybe make them think about it. But, you know, we got to think of a better way to do this overall. And the governance piece, I think, understanding that flow, going back to this, we have to understand identity flow so we can build the right governance model to put on top. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. Uh, I, you know, how many of us literally you know, get a list of identity, you know, um, identities and their access and we literally go ask them one by one if you still need this access. That doesn't work, right? Nobody does that. They, they go and they think they know the answer and they check the box and they move on the, with their lives, daily, you know, the tasks. Um, I agree. I think, I think you need, um, you know, in, in the age of automation, cloud, you need automation to be able to address these from a governance uh, compliance perspective. Um, otherwise, you know, you're, you're applying a manual process to a highly automated process that, that's not going to scale. And, um, you know, you're going to have blind spots that's going to, you know, check the compliance box potentially, perhaps, but, you know, you're not doing security. Great point, Al. Thank you. Um, just shifting gears, right? I mean, the, you know, with the, with the massive growth of, you know, an interest in generative AI and new technologies, how does it change the time frame? I mean, we've seen massive amounts of data being shared using Gen AI and large language models. What's the pressure on organizations to think about it? You know, especially in terms of access control, access reviews, governance. How do you think about this sort of new phenomena of, of uh, uh, generative AI and uh, and LLMs that's just coming coming uh, at kind of rocket speed into the, in the enterprises? Up, up, maybe I'll take oh, yeah. that. Um, yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, whether it's users, applications, or other service endpoints that we have in our environments, um, they tend to, 
be leveraging generative AI technologies such as GPTs more and more, um, you know, for whether it's marketing purposes, sales purposes, customer success, QA, whatever the, the, the process internal business unit is, uh, it's being leveraged more and more. And um, I think if you just, you know, look around your organization, you can see that um, and that's going to proliferate uh, going forward. So, but these GPTs, you know, they, they're, they're based on models, right? They're based on large language models that are hungry for <laughs> large data sets. And uh, who better than to, you know, your, your, your data scientists, your engineers, your uh, marketing folks to be able to feed them that data, right? And so that's what they're looking for. Um, and so when you're building, when engineering teams are building APIs or building these access mechanisms for these LLMs to access, you know, your, your data and your data sets to enrich them, to, to help them learn and train, that's where you know you get into these risky situations where you have you don't have the visibility, right? You don't know what that API potentially is built for. You don't know what level of access they have into your internal, you know, data stores. And yet, you know, they're being fed to these models that are um, hungry for data that needed to learn. And so, that level of visibility is typically missing today. And there isn't a good technology out right now that's uh, being that's able to address that. And so. Having that blind spot, um, you know, with these models um, is, is a significant risk to organizations, one that I don't think a lot of security teams know about, um, but they're learning, you know, about LLMs and AI and Gen AI and GPT, um, you know, uh, as time goes on. Thanks, Al. Uh, you know, can you lead the governance initiative at Fleet Corps? I'm sure this is a huge uh, pressure point for, uh, for your growth in your organization. So how do you think about this new phenomena? So I think I think it's a tool, right? I do I do think ultimately this is a tool. It's a tool that can be used for great things. It's a tool that can be used for bad things. When I think about what the capabilities and the the great things that can possibly be used for um, in in the, in this area of shadow access that we're talking about, and it just identity and access in general, right? I think it it offers you a possibility if you get it out of the public realm and you're protecting that data and you're you're doing it inside some some guardrails and and not putting this out there for other people to find but i do think it gives you the ability to talk about some of what we're talking about data correlation data quality helping you be faster to understand how data how that identity is flowing in your environment how you can clean it up and it should be able to help you maybe make decisions up front on access. It should, you know, hopefully, I think ideally what you see is, is if I'm going to provision somebody access in the system using AI, if for an example, I should be able to model that access throughout the environment, figure out maybe where I've got these overprivileged problems, fix that, and it can help me identify that. But on the go and on the government side of government side of it, it can also help me clean up people's access and hey, hey, this person's no longer doing this. This is this is something that they've not accessed in a long time. And it can start helping you build out a way to ferret out overprivileged, move ad change, stale access. Uh, you know, just it can help you find all that. And I think in a way to help you tighten up your governance process, help you remove uh, that that trifecta of bad things down the road, right? Of of, of an overprivileged, you know. And you got you can start looking at risk, right? Risk of identity. You can start looking at how they've got too much privilege. They've got uh, unrestricted access to the internet. They've also got access to critical data, right? I can look at those three things right now. I've got a now I've got a trifecta of bad things right for this person to have in their identity, and I can start looking at other places where their identity can maybe pivot right. That's where I see the the meat of where AI can help us in this is it helps us figure out where we may have an issue if Ken's identity gets us, uh, gets compromised. And on top of that, I can probably start building out ways of looking at what is normal for me. What is my normal day? How am I using my identity? And I can start maybe getting into that incident response and that security operations piece of it going. I can now start to detect an anomaly in the way an identity is behaving. I'm not going to say it's a person. Like I told you before, I think identity should are assets. 
uh, I brought this up in another conversation we've had, right? Their assets, just like everything else. And that asset may be a person, may be a machine. You know, there's a multiple ways to look at that. So you need to be able to manage those assets. And if we're using AI in the right way, it's going to allow us to start visualizing anomalies to the way that asset is being interacted with or interacting with something, another asset. And I ultimately think that's the best thing about AI. On the opposite end of that, it can be used to do the same thing, but to figure out a way for the threat actor to come in and find overprivileged or shadow access and figure out ways and faster they can get what they want to get from us quieter and faster using AI because they're able to figure out where these where these paths are that don't set off alarms, do not set off flags. And then they can start doing what they want to do with the data after they've been able to get to it without setting off an alert. So that's what I think about AI in this, in this specific vertical, specific topic. Um, I, we can probably talk about it all day because it's all we've all been talking about for the last year on what it does and can and can't do. But I think in this topic, this is where I would like to focus it. Great, great commentary. Thank you. Uh, love the trifecta. Love the trifecta thought as well. Um, let me uh, let me kind of switch topics. Um, you know, you know, in this webinar, we have hundreds of practitioners logged in right now, and they have lots of their day jobs, lots of priorities. Uh, they're dealing with IAM, governance, compliance, you know, cloud security. They're bombarded with new, new terms, you know, CIAM, CSPM, CNAP, you know, IGA, you know, now it's shadow access. Where is this problem, uh, you know, in that in the prioritization of practitioners? You both have large teams, built large programs around security and compliance and, and IT. Where does Shadow X rank in the prioritization? Is it an urgent problem? What are your thoughts on that? And what's your advice to practitioners looking at the space, trying to understand and get their arms around what the problem is and, and the impact areas around Shadow Access? Uh, perhaps, Al, I can start with you. Yeah, I think this is a this is a legacy problem, right? This is this has existed before the before cloud, before AI, you know, GPT and Gen AI, et cetera, et cetera, and these models. Um, I think first and foremost, um, you know, you have to, in order to clean this tech data, I think you have to start with your um, inventory of, of your your identities and, you know, whether it's end users or applications or service endpoints, um, API, service tokens, et cetera. So you need to get your arms around it, I think, uh, first and foremost. You have to have that level of visibility. Um, and then I think you need to start building a systematic process. I always believe in process and procedure before technology. But you ultimately, because of automation and cloud, you have to utilize you know, some automation and some technology to be able to provide you the entitlements uh, that you need based on end user, machine, and service um, uh, context, as well as business context. What do they need access to and for what purposes? So all that has to be defined. Um, and then it, it boils down to go back to observability and monitoring and being able to audit um, so that you can manage your governance and compliance expectations, whether it's your customers or third party regulators, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that also helps facilitate, I think, incident response. When you when it gets when it comes down to it, if you don't have that visibility, you're not gonna be able to to respond adequately um, and sufficiently. So I think those three or four things combined. Um, you know, put you in a position to be able to address shadow access. I'm not saying go back and re-architect your whole, you know, identity and access management paradigm. I, I, all I'm asking is to, in order to clean your legacy tech debt in this space, those are the steps you have to take. And you could do them sequential or you could do them in parallel. It doesn't really matter. Great point. And also a lot of the tech debt that came around the uh, legacy world is not catching up in cloud because there's no escape in the cloud. <laughs> So you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna find out pretty soon, uh, unfortunately, you know, using some sort of a breach or incident. Ken, what, what's your take on your advice? Is this a, do you agree this is an urgent problem? Or what's your take on this? Yeah, I definitely think it's an urgent problem, right? I think it's a problem we've been trying to figure out for a while, even in the legacy side of on-prem, right? I think the problem once you move it into the cloud, it happens faster, right? Uh, you know, the the great thing about the cloud is is it is it allows you to operate at a higher speed. Well, it allows you to screw up at a high speed too. Right? So, <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, you're right. It's the, bla the blast 
the blast moves at a higher rate of speed <laughs> when it's inside the cloud, right? Um, and I, and I think it's an it's somewhat of an overlook. I've I've been hearing people talk about it, although shadow access is a fairly new term, right? We've talked about it for years. Is uh, we've talked about shadow IT for years about those unknown things that are happening in IT. And it really was, you know, kind of started with the advent of the SaaS service, exactly. SaaS products, right? And you think about access in the cloud, it's your segmentation for the most part, right? By the nat native nature of a way a cloud environment is by default is designed. It's a big flat network that everything's inside of. And security groups become your kind of segmentation, right? Now, granted, there are some networking things you can do, and it, it, but again, we're going back to that question about us versus them from operations, security risk things, <laughs> right? Uh, it's faster to use security groups and do that than it is to build out transit gateways and VPCs for everything and try to try to do that kind of thing, right? So I, I think it's I think it's a big problem. I think it's probably a bigger problem than people have alluded to because they, they kind of had the walls of or the gate, I guess, around that internal side, but now they've moved it out into the cloud and, and that, that little bit of a gate we had at the edge is no longer there. Right. So it, uh, that's what worries me about it is it's, it's going to, it's going to break things faster. Yeah. I think to sum it up, I, I think if, if I may, um, at least this topic, there's a lot of unknown unknowns that, that, we don't know about. Uh, that's what's scary, right? Uh, we know what we know, but the unknown unknowns is, is the scary part uh, when it comes to shadow access. Great point, Al. Unknown unknowns, and uh, you know, I like the term "screw up velocity." Also, <laughs> explodes <laughs> in the cloud. It's a great, great line. Uh, thank you both. It's been a wonderful fireside session. Thank you for sharing your perspective and advice to practitioners. Uh, thank you, Al and Ken. Absolutely. Thank you. So now we learned a bit about shadow access, and we heard from uh, Ken and Al uh, on practical things uh, they should be thinking about. Uh, the people should be thinking about where do you start, and you know what do you do next. So let me set the context for that. Uh, you know, the first thing is to get the visibility. We heard from our panel today about visibility inventory. and that's what the shadow access impact report is. So what is this report? This report is produced by Stack Identity. We are one of the vendors in the shadow access space, a pioneer in the space. And this report is an amalgamation of multiple types of patterns that exist in cloud environments. Uh, we onboard customer accounts into our platform, uh, whether it's AWS or Kubernetes or Azure or GCP. We understand the live traffic and we figure out what are the shadow access patterns that exist today. And we've distilled these patterns into 10 different types. So this is a real report based on live data, of course, anonymized. So practitioners can understand you know, whether or not, what are the various types of access, uh, shadow access patterns that exist. And we'll discuss about 10 types of patterns in a minute here. And that gives you a sense of what's going on in the environment uh, and is really live, you know, how's it, or how does it happen? What are the root causes and things like that? Let me give you a couple of, uh, uh, quick nuggets from the report. The first thing we're seeing is based on our analysis of in 80 plus accounts, we see in the cloud is very different compared to on-prem traditional conventional IAM. Most identities are non-human. They are you know, attached to cloud services, APIs, you know, platforms and data platforms. And typically they're over-permissioned, right? And over-privileged, why? Because of automation. To the extent that 96% of all the identities in the cloud are actually non-human, and this is growing. So big observation is that the, the majority of identities in the cloud are really not the human type. And second thing is because of automation and because the way you provision access and entitlements and permissions from the cloud used through uh, Terraform or infrastructure as code, we have a lot of identities to the explosive uh, you know, right access or right permissions. Almost three fourths of our accounts we discovered have right access. Almost one third have permission to manage permissions. This is the most egregious permission in, in AWS, because you can do whatever you want with this permission. You can actually erode your own permission. So this creates a lot of toxic combinations, but awareness of these identities, what permissions they have, you know, what uh, permission types they have is hugely important if you want to kind of start to wrangle a shadow access. 
Another important observation is, based on these account analysis, is the proliferation of admin privileges in the cloud. Now, you know, I grew up in the IAM space. We're all taught to look at admins as really administrators. But the cloud is very different. You can, have, you can attach admin privileges to any role. And therefore, in the cloud, what we're seeing is 5% of all the identities have admin permissions. In most organizations, there should be less than 1%. And 16% of these uh, you know, identities have actually privilege escalation permissions. They completely violate the principle of release privilege. Three times the number of admins. So you have a combination of an admin type access and the ability for that the identity to escalate their own permissions and privilege escalate. And that's a massive toxic combination. So these two really, at the end of the day, completely breaks all types of, you know, conventional in IAM processes as two data points here. Our report goes through, goes through a lot of the details here around you know, things like invisible access you know, unwanted access, excessive access, both Ken and Al talked about it. Dormant access, because of the speed of cloud, people are given credentials or identities and they go into a different project. And we have now credentials lying around, not being used for 60, 90, you know, even you know, six months, you know, Given all these new applications and, and Gen AI, it's all about cross-account access. You know, your access to KMS services, these are the data recovery access. Risky access, you know, essentially toxic combinations. Uh, and then these are the kind of things we can discover automatically. This gives you an inventory of what's happening in the cloud account. But the easy thing is to you're able to digest and absorb the different patterns to of access. It just gives you a sense of what's happening in my account and, and start to kind of dig into and ask more questions of the data and start to get to some sort of a practitioner view as to how do I deal with this problem. And if you need more information, you can go to our website, you can download this as well uh, from our uh, website. If I were to leave it one thought, it's really about toxic combinations, right? It's all about the various identity types. It's all about the various access types. And these combinations create enormous blast radius. To what? To your data stores. You know, your developers are spinning up you know, S3 buckets and databases and SQL databases. And now they're, you know, spinning up, you know, LLM databases, vector databases and things like that. So we've seen a lot of these toxic combinations being very, very prevalent in this because data is proliferating these environments. And this is really an easy, easy, you know, uh, you know position for attackers uh, because all the entitlements are legitimate entitlements. All you need is one legitimate entitlement. You need to find some exposure. Now you can laterally move across the organization to get your crown jewels and you can exfiltrate data. So really, toxic combinations are going to be the new thought process beyond shadow access and start to better on this. This is really problematic because AWS alone has got 15,000 permissions and growing, but this is a very, very massive problem. Now, from an impact perspective, why do I care right now? I mean, we are seeing many cases, and if you look at the Verizon report, you can look at it. The last 20, 25 breaches is all has a single attribution. It's all about a credential or an entitlement that's been uh, problematic. And so this is an easy problem with a huge impact on the risk side, whether it's malware hosting, whether it's you know, crypto mining, whether it's you know, outright data breaches, whether exfiltration, you know, entitlements are an easy way to get to where you want to go. And that's the world we live in, in terms of a shadow access. So let me quickly jump into a demo. Let me go you. Let me show you a specific example, a pattern of shadow access, the most commonly used pattern in cloud environments today. So this is our uh, console, unified console. We look at uh, we've onboarded many many cloud accounts here across AWS, GCP, and Azure environments, as well as your private clouds as well. We are discovering lots of activities uh, across a lot of accounts. So I'm, I'm going to go through a single account called the uh, called the staging uh, sandbox account here. Uh, and this sandbox account has got a lot of data assets already discovered. And one of the unique things about Stack is that we automatically discover all your data assets, all the applications, all the security groups, all the network, uh, you know, ACLs, and we put this map together. So I'm going to go to a data asset here, and I can see you can see we have discovered a lot of data assets. You know, S3 buckets very very popular, RDS, DynamoDB, SQL Server, Snowflake. You can keep on and on. I'm going to choose a specific example called this S3 Jenkins Access. As you can see, S3 is a very, very popular service, object store. Okay, AWS customers have got thousands of S3 buckets. I'm going to choose a single S3 bucket. It's called the S3 Jenkins Access bucket. It's because this bucket is actually storing code artifacts. So developers are building and deploying, uh, you know, build environments through Jenkins, which is a very popular CI CD tool. 
They're deploying these applications into S3, S3 storing them. So let's take a look at uh, you know, the activities on the single S3 bucket. Now this bucket at the very top, you can see the logo here. It's, it's been accessed by multiple applications. At least there are three different applications on this particular S3 bucket. I can move this around. You'll see there's a little snowflake instance there that is doing ETL extraction on this S3 bucket. You've got a bunch of Lambda functions and some API gateways exposing you know, ephemeral serverless applications. And you have a bunch of you know, nodes that are deployed using Jenkins. You have a Jenkins master node. It's got a bunch of worker nodes that together support engineering teams to deploy core artifacts into this S3 bucket. Now let's look at the S3 bucket quickly for a second. If I click on this link, I'll get a quick snapshot of all the data posture on this bucket. This uh, data asset is not tagged, right? There's a problematic. Uh, Versioning is not enabled. Uh, website, hard, website hosting is enabled, but we'll see I have same anomalies in this configuration. Access logging is not enabled. So we see already this bucket is not in a very good posture. And primarily, I do not know whether or not this bucket has got sensitive data or not. Since there's no data, I have to assume this bucket actually has got something sensitive. Now I'm going to turn your attention to this red line, which is what we call a shadow access pattern. So this pattern is all about the CI/CD application Jenkins using S3 as an object store and deploying code artifacts. If you click on the link between this Jenkins master node and this S3 bucket, if you click on this link here, you'll see the Jenkins master application is using this role here to write to, this, uh, to write to the S3 Jenkins access. And this master application, as you can expect, has got read permissions, tagging permissions, write permissions. Of course, it needs to write to the S3 that makes sense to me. It's got list permissions, and it's got permission managed permissions. Wow, okay, that's problematic. I already showed you in the, in the report, almost one third of identities have permission management permissions. Here is an example of permission management permission. This means that this server can, can privilege escalate their own permissions easily uh, through APIs, and that's what this means. So now, they essentially, they have complete takeover of the account control uh, in this cloud account. Now, on top of that, this Jenkins you know, master is connected to the internet through this link here. If I click on this link, you'll see, for example, there's now a network pathway. So that Jenkins master is directly attached to the, to the internet. It's got port 22 open, inbound, port 80 is inbound, as well as all ports are open, both inbound and outbound. That's problematic. So now we're seeing you know, a, you know, a very, very you know, you know, sensitive application, a CICD pipeline with Jenkins having permission management permissions to write and change permissions and privilege escalate onto the S3 bucket and that server has got access to the internet, direct access to the internet. So this is what we call as a toxic combination, right? It's not one or the other. It's a combination of the fact that it's now a server which has got explosive access to, to privilege escalate. It's got the most important permission, which is uh, permission management on AWS. It's directly attached to the internet, and it's got inbound and outbound traffic open. Now, how it happened, we do not know, but this is the current state. This is a live attack map. So in about an hour, if you come and rerun this graph, we'll have a different view perhaps new, new applications have shown up on the S3 bucket. Now, five minutes before this demo, everything was fine. This was, a, this was a, in a blue line. All of a sudden now, somebody went and attached this permission management permission through a policy. And that changed this blue line, a normal line, to a red line and a toxic combination. This has now become a weaponized, active, live attack pathway for an attacker. So now, stack identity is watching this all the time, and right away, now we can go to this uh, Slack channel. And now, we're, now the moment somebody attaches this policy, we are automatically in the next in the next you know, two seconds sending a Slack notification saying, hey, look, there's now a risky policy attached to an EC2 workload in this example. And this is this presents a type of a data exfiltration risk. A risky instance profile has been attached to the internet access. Uh, in this case, it's a Jenkins master is the name of the node, which by the way is also open to the internet. So give you the account name, we give you the cloud ID, we give you the profile instance, we give you the, the, give the instance profile role, because everything is right there for you to take an action. Now, people have attached to, you know, various types of uh, workflows to this. You can put this in Jira, you can send it to your, your incident response, you can uh, send it to your, to your page duty. All this are possible. The idea is that the moment something happens, and when the blue line turns to red, Stack is watching this and instantaneously now triggering a Slack notification for somebody to take action because now this is an egregious problem. Now, please note this is not a you know this is not a false positive, right? This is really about this is really about uh, you know 
Uh, let me go back to demo for a second. This is really live attack map. This is really data and evidence on this graph. It's showing live. So uh, this 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 getting this graph is is a lot of work, and and and, and this changes all the time. So the heavy lifting is all about automation. It's all about the, the connection, the correlation, and the context to make sure that people have the right context, the right visibility, and the right sort of risks they want to prioritize so that they can, they can take action. So that's a quick demo of the, of the product. Let me turn this back into, the, uh, into my final screen here. If you want to learn more about uh, you know, Stack, you know, you know, if you want to do a call to action, the first thing is you can look at our you know, website. You can look at the Shadow Access Impact Report on the ebook, which just gives you a sense of what others are doing, what's happening in the other environments. You get the benefit of, of learning about Shadow Access and the common patterns that Shadow Access uh, lives in the environments, across cloud environments. Now, once you've got that environment in the report, if you want to see actually what's happening in my environment, how do I do this? Well, you, you go to the same link. You download uh, our, our free you know, uh, tool. It's called Shadow Access Risk Assessment. You download this tool, you deploy this locally. We don't need any credentials. It runs in your environment. You connect up to your environment, your AWS and your cloud trails. You get a daily, daily sort of risk assessment report sent to your inbox. Very simple. So that's sort of the, uh, you know, it concludes the, uh, the presentation. Uh, and uh, and I open up for questions as well. And pro probably you can also put in from some poll questions as well here. So uh, we did receive a few questions throughout our program. And so we're going to take a couple of them just from the top. Uh, our first question is, where do I learn more about shadow access? Vincat, could you help us out there? Sure, Cody. Yeah, I think the first thing is you can go to our website, uh, stackidentity.com. Uh, there are two links there. One is the link for the shadow access impact report. It just gives you a sense of uh, the common patterns we discussed today. And if you want to really uh, run these patterns in your own environment, you can download the code, which is the uh, Shadow Access Risk Assessment tool. And that allows you to run this uh, code in your own environment and discover your own Shadow Access patterns and start to get visibility to those patterns and start to take some action from there. Awesome. Thank you. I've, I've pinned that resource to the top of the chat for anyone who, who would like to quickly grab that. Um, so, Al, I'm going to direct this next question to you. What problems can Stack Identity solve for me today when it comes to shadow access? Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, <clears throat> before you adopt a technology, I would say <clears throat> build a process, build a build some kind of strategy around uh, specifically around your cloud cloud infrastructure, entitlement management, uh, and then use uh, you know something like a Stack Identity, uh, which does a great job, I think. <clears throat> from a capability perspective to help you manage your cloud identities and entitlements. I think that's first and foremost. Um, you know, ease, I would say ease some of the pain points around your compliance activities. I know we've had issues, concerns around, you know, uh, when it comes time for, for audit, right? How do we, how do we, have we done all the things that we need to do to check those boxes? So managing your compliance activities as they pertain to access reviews, for example, uh, Stack Identity can help uh, from that perspective. Um, automate a lot of that, right? Where a lot of us still are in the spreadsheet, Google Sheet kind of mode where we pass those around every time an audit comes around and you know you manage those um, in a very inefficient way, but Stack can 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 Stack Identity can help automate those uh, reviews and, and make them continuous versus a point in time, right? So that we don't have to do it uh, on a quarterly basis. We just it's just done. All you do is take an extract and uh, give it to your auditors when the time comes and feel confident that uh, you've met their needs. Um, so yeah, the benefit of this is really just being compliant all the time versus you know when the audit period hits. Uh, and then last and foremost, I would say, you know, we hit on this and, and Venka touched on this quite a bit, is to provide the visibility, the observability that you need in terms of um, discovering identities and entitlements in the cloud. And that also helps from an uh, incident response perspective. So if you have a potential incident, um, it can help you identify who accessed what, when, why, so that you can pinpoint the uh, root cause and address those issues. So I would say that's, a, I think, a three, four-prong approach that I would take with Stack Identity. Great. Thank you, Al. Um, Ken, we're not seeing your video. I want to make sure your audio comes through. Can I get a mic check? 
Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, perfect. So how do I start to find and fix shadow access in my environment? Uh, Ken, do you have any thoughts there? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think to kind of go off of what we're looking at, right, is that's that's the whole purpose behind stack identity, right, is if without having to do this in a manual way, which is probably what you would have to do today, you would you would have to sit down and, and call through all your all your process, all your all your identity and access that's set up in these environments and get a great picture of how it's doing it. Whereas a tool using a tool like Stack Identity would allow you to go in and map that out and visualize it and understand how that identity is being used and flows inside those environments. Uh, <clears throat> because I think if you do this manually, you're just not going to do it. Uh, you know, it's 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 another task that's tedious and time consuming, and you need to be you need to be able to automate and visualize and understand how this identity is being used and where the immediacy is when it needs to be something that you need to react to very quickly and not something that you've got a lot of time to spend figuring out why that access was there. Just uh, start visualizing it and move forward. Yeah, but if I can add one thing on top of that. Um, and Ben got hit on this quite a bit, is those toxic combinations. I think that's the uh, sweet spot for stack identities, helping you, you know, not just identify who has overprivilege, but, you know, looking at third parties that may be dormant, for example, right, a developer that might be overprivileged, um, or even a stale account that uh, might have, um, you know, potentially unauthorized access to something that you don't know about. Um, so it's, I think, you know, to drill down a little deeper, it's the combination of those um, identities and access types that that make them toxic, and that's where I think Stack can can help you all. If you can even add add to that, uh, what Al just said, uh, you know, we have you know the topic today was uh, cloud security meets IAM. In many cases, you know, customers conventional IAM uh, doesn't get provide the visibility. And neither does cloud security. So the shadow access is right at the middle of these two processes, but both need to be, you know, you know, modernized. So that's where the challenge is coming from because they're managed for two different teams, and things uh, crack and fall through the middle. It's important to get the visibility first, and then then instrument your processes, whether it's IAM, whether it's DevOps, whether it's cloud security. It's a consequence of figuring out where the problem is, why it exists, and then take a, appropriate action across the teams. Perfect. Well, Venkat, Ken, and Al, we are at the top of our hour. Um, so I did want to give each of you the opportunity to leave our audience with, with maybe one closing remark. If you have anything top of mind that um, you think is an absolute takeaway from this last last hour, um, what, what would that be? Al, I'll, I'll put you on the spot first. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to, um, I don't have to dig too deep, right? Just look at what's been happening uh, past uh, several uh, breaches all been around access, for unauthorized access. And so at the core of it, you know, the bad actors, they want to get to your data. And the easiest way to do that is, uh, is to use access mechanisms. And so for us, it's important to be able to address this. And shadow access is a huge problem for us. And so, um, you know, uh, solutions such as Stack Identity can really help us, um, you know, not just manage access and entitlements, but also have the visibility that we need, that we've been missing for such a long time. And like I said, it's still a problem issue for us because you don't have to look too far, but the last few uh, breaches that have been happening. All right, Ken, your thoughts? I mean, I'm probably going to echo what Al put out there. I mean, it's. It, the problem is, is when it's authorized access, it's very hard to detect it with any of your other tools, right? So you better understand what that act, what people have access to, how they're using their identity, where it's moving data, where it is, where it has exposed you in a way that you didn't know you had been exposed. <clears throat> because more than likely your security operations team and your incident response team and your tools are not designed to tell me that Cody, who has legitimate access to something, is actually accessing it, right? What it, and, and if Cody is smart about how he's doing it, he's going to move data around in a way that doesn't trip any other, doesn't trip any other flags, right? So, have a good process. And then, then I, I think the second piece of this is don't automate a shitty process, right? As as I like to say, that just makes it diarrhea. What you really want to what you really want to do is you want to 
rethink your process and rethink how would I automate this in a way to benefit the company and to reduce risk. I do not want to automate something just to automate it. I actually want to automate it to make us more efficient. Stack identity and tools like that can help you visualize and help you automate. What you really have to think through, though, is how that process needs to be used and what you need to do to automate that process and make it efficient using the tooling that's out there. So just think before you act is probably the best thing I can say there. That's just a good rule of thumb all around. All right, yeah. Vincat, bring us home. Yeah, I'm, I'm a fantastic uh, final thoughts. Uh, I'll just pick up on what uh, Ken said. Uh, it's it's not the tools. I would say start with the process. Uh, start with the, the the guardrail gaps in your guardrails. That's most important, and then figure out where are the gaps, why does it manifest, and where do we need to fix. So today we are we have a deluge of tools uh, from cloud providers and others. Uh, but I would say, and given the resources are very scarce and customers don't start with the process figure out uh, how do you want to reimagine the process for the world of cloud, cloud native, data, AI, and all these environments. And then make sure you identify the gaps to your processes and then start to instrument uh, with better design, better guardrails, better automation. And that's a way to go. Wonderful. Well, we, we've gone about two minutes over, but I think it was really important information to, to capture here at the end. So to everyone in our audience, thank you so much for, for being here with us still as we close things out. And to Al, Ken, and, and Vinkat, thank you so much for spending the time with us today on TechStrong Learning. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. So just a quick reminder to our audience before we close things out, we have been recording our session. You will be receiving the recording via email, and you can also find it on the Security Boulevard website. That's securityboulevard.com slash webinars, and it will be in the on-demand section. The two winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing are Tunde D and Josiane C. Um, so to both of our winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your inbox. You'll be receiving an email from myself here shortly. If you don't happen to see an email from me, just check your spam folder uh, just in case it happens to end up there. I'd like to thank Stack Identity for sponsoring our program today. And to everyone here, thank you so much for being here. Um, as we close things out, uh, the webinar will close and you'll be directed to our post-webinar survey. Um, so just let us know your thoughts about our program today or future topic suggestions. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Either way, we do hope to see everyone at a future Tech Strong Learning experience. Have a great rest of your day, and you may now disconnect. Ken, Al, and Vincat, thank you all once again. Thank you. Thank you.